Hey, what's up dudes? Brad the Guitologist here. In this video, we're gonna have uh, something a little bit different. I don't think I've ever had one of these on the channel. This is a, what I think is about, I don't know, mid to late 1990s Crate Blue Voodoo 60. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, stick around. Today's video is sponsored by the Song Songwriting Inspiration app. With Song, you can quickly organize over 6,000 guitar chords into major and minor keys and start writing more sophisticated, harmonically rich songs. Save your lyrical ideas and record quick melodies right inside the app to stay organized. Check out the Song Songwriting Inspiration app today. Links in the description. Crate sold a lot of these in the US. These have two, I believe it's 6L6s that's in this. This one, I think the customer said it was cutting out after it's been on for a little while. So we're gonna have to track down a schematic most likely for this. Now these were made by St. Louis Music, made and distributed by them. St. Louis Music supplies a lot of different things to a lot of different mom and pop shops throughout kind of the Midwest, the South, uh, really all over. Uh, and especially back in the 90s when this thing came out, St. Louis Music was responsible for supplying a lot of mom and pop stores with stuff that they could sell. Now these, you know, were touted as being made in the USA. I believe that is 100% accurate as far as I know. Now, you know, they're, they're going to have the modern PCB construction on the inside, most likely. I'm fairly certain if they're anything like the other crates, but I have never been inside of one of these, so it should be interesting for me to see at least how one of these is constructed. Uh, you could see we've got a couple of channels here. We've got a volume, low, mid, bright switch right there. And then it has a, uh, what is that? Oh, that's the highs. Then you have a channel switch right there. You have gain. Uh, you have a little boost switch tucked right in there. You have a low, high, mid, and high right there. And a master volume. And I'm not certain whether the master volume covers both channels or whether it just covers the second channel. It's not clear just looking at the front panel. I assume it's universal and covers both channels, but I don't know. Uh, then we have reverb, or they just have it labeled reverb and then presence, the amount of reverb and presence. So they add depth and presence with a standby switch and a power switch. So that's the front. Okay, so the customer left me a note in the back of the amp, and it does say it begins to cut out after a while, and there's no output noise. I presume after a while there becomes no output. So that sounds to me like something's going on maybe with the biasing of the output. Perhaps it's something very similar to the last amp that we saw with that Mesa Boogie that uh, I just did recently. Um, but you can see on the back here, it looks like maybe they've got a imminent speaker in here, and this thing, I'll tell you what, I just carried this, uh, brought it over from my other house, and this speaker that's in here is heavy. So I have to get a little closer look. Sometimes Eminence, they tag their speakers kind of on the side of the magnet, um, and I'm guessing that's what it is. It's an Eminence that's tagged on the side. Uh, but it does look like it's been serviced before. There is a service tag on it. Check this out. Okay, so it does say it's been serviced before. Professional service by Audio Video Electronics, and that's in Richmond, Kentucky. So it's had a service before. Hopefully they did a good job. I mean, they, they at least have a they at least have a little sticker there. They put their name to it, in other words. They kind of signed off on it, so maybe they did a good job. Uh, sometimes, man, when you see stuff that's serviced before, that's not always the case. Sometimes stuff has been really boogered up on the inside as a result of someone else getting a hold of it before me and hopefully that's not the case here uh you can see on the back we have what is that a ground that's some kind of direct ground screw so like if you're in a studio and you're getting some hum issues maybe you can uh ground this to your rack um effects setup or something you know you run a ground wire from one to the other right there so i mean that's kind of a cool feature you've got a fuse holder here got an ac plug there hum balance which is nice to see i mean that's different you don't always see a hum balance control on the rear end of an amp uh, there you can see slm electronics that's st louis music electronics st louis missouri and i'm looking for them yeah it says usa right up there so i think this is made in the usa we've got a foot switch right there for channel select boost and reverb uh, effects loop center return there's no control or attenuator for the effects loop it's just 
effects loop. A balanced output, so if you're doing recording and you want just the preamp so you can come you know, into a board from the preamp, uh, you have some options on your speakers. 60 watts it claims right there. We do have the foot switch, so that's gonna help us make sure that you know there's no problems with channel switching and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, this should be, you know, like I said, a somewhat interesting one because I've never had one of these before on the channel. So first, let's see what's going on with it. There's two ways you can approach stuff like this, and so many times what I'll do is I'll just pull the chassis and assume that the customer is correct. So I'll have, you know, have the chassis out, assuming the customer's right and what he's saying is going on with the thing. You know, I'll just start troubleshooting it with the chassis out. But a lot of people are like, hey man, why didn't you show us what the problem was? Or why don't you show us what it was doing, you know, the symptoms? And sometimes I skip that part. So here lately I've been trying to do that, trying to show what's going on. You know, but a lot of people will chime in also and say, you don't even know the state of the thing and you're turning it on and you're, you know, you're risking messing something up by doing that. Well, yeah, in a way. Uh, but I'm also dialing things up on a Variac to make sure that there's no dead shorts or anything like that before I try something like that. And a lot of times, too, it'll, it'll be really instructive to fire an amp up in situ and try to see what it, exactly it's doing and what the customer might have experienced before you go yanking the chassis out. Because sometimes, you know, it might be so, something as simple as like a bad connection to a speaker, you know, or something like that. Kind of anymore, I like to see what it's doing, test it out before I, you know, just rip into the thing. So let's do that first. We'll test it out, see if it, we can recreate the problem and then we'll kind of go from there. Okay guys, we've got this thing up on the bench now. Um, I know this is not ideal. I don't have very good lighting here at the moment, but I do at least have a bench, it's functional and uh, we'll do our best with what we have here. So it's up here on the bench. I've got the uh, Variac, you can barely see it. It's back there, right there behind the uh, unit. So we're gonna turn the Variac on and dial it up slowly and uh, see if we can sort of recreate the problem. I'll also keep a very close eye on the uh, current draw to make sure that it's not uh, drawing anything in excess. Okay, so here we are with the uh, amp flipped around and the little back door off and we can see that we have uh, pair of Softec output tubes here. Uh, they are 6L6s. Just as I thought, we have a code 67 over here on the speaker. Right there, you can see that 67 before that dash. That means that this is an eminent speaker, 8 ohms. But yeah, we're going to go ahead and dial this thing up on the Variac and see what it does. It does say here that we can expect 360 watts of power consumption on the main line, which is, that seems uh, pretty high but we'll see if that's accurate. Uh, let's go ahead and start dialing this thing up. We want to pay special attention to uh, the output tubes to see if they start red plating or anything after a certain point in time. Okay, just powering it up now. And we do have a light on the front, so there does appear to be at least some life. Now we're at our, our halfway stopping point and so far, at least, I don't see anything obvious, which I wouldn't probably this early in the game. We're only drawing about 14 watts, so that's certainly not excessive. I do hear a, a little bit of low speaker hum. Okay, I've got a guitar plugged into it, and although I've got a little bit of hum, I have nothing on, on the output. We got, some, we got some very dirty controls on the front. That might be part of the problem. Okay, already I can tell we've got one hot tube right here and we've got one ice cold tube. I think we got a bad set of output tubes. It's just, it's displaying that kind of behavior. Okay, it's dialed up to now to 100 volts on the input. This tube is continuing to get very hot while this one completely ice cold. So I think we've just, we have a, we have a case where we have one completely bad tube uh, and we have one that's working overtime as a result of the bad tubes. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and flip it off and uh, see if I've got a, a pair of tubes I can pop in here. Okay, so I pulled these tubes out of the amp and I didn't realize that these are 5881s. I, I just saw the 6L6 and I assumed that they were just 6L6 GCs, but they're not. They're, they're 5881s, uh, which generally means that 
they are going to be lower plate dissipation, lower output than a uh, standard 606 GC, but they're Sovtec or Sovtec, which means that usually these are really extremely robust 5881s, and they're really almost on par with um, uh, with 606 GCs in terms of what they can handle in in real numbers, not just necessarily what's published. I'm not even sure if this has paperwork on it, this particular Sovtec 5881 tube. Um, but I already know for a fact that these can handle more than the published specs on a 5881, or tr a traditional old school 5881. So, uh, and both of these also tested good on my tester. So we've got some other problem most likely in this amplifier uh, other than the output tubes. Now you'll remember one of them was getting really warm and the other one was acting as if it was stone cold, as if there was nothing going on. But again, both tested good. Both the filaments heated up, so that was good. And both of them pretty much pegged the meter when I tested them out on my uh, my old school precision tester. So these are good tubes. Now, here is the inside of the amp. You know, this is kind of what you expect to see. This is why a lot of techs won't take in a lot of modern stuff, man. This is just par for the course for some modern things. This one is made in 1995, I believe. Yeah, 295. I think that means that this thing was made in 1995. You can see a little transistor right there. I'm guessing that's in the switching circuit. We do have a couple of uh, fuses in here. We've got a raised board for the output tubes. Um, and you'll notice something about this. What is it that you notice about this board and the components and the way that it's all mounted? I mean, besides the fact that it's all PCB, obviously, but what else do you notice about it? This is a single-sided board. Uh, there are no pads on this side of the board, so you can only service this thing if you have to change parts. Uh, by e Well, you can do it in one of two ways. You can either clip the part out and uh, J-hook on the new parts on the top, or you can pull the whole board out of this thing. Uh, another... Another issue you'll see is that the pots are all direct mounted to the PCB. That is, there's no there's no wires that are running up to the pots to decouple them from you know direct contact with the PCB. Which means, and the same is true actually of the uh, input jack as well. And this is the way a lot of things are made, man. From you know the 90s on to today, a lot of you know less expensive stuff. Is made in exactly this way, and they do it, you know, because they're trying to penny pinch and they're keeping the cost down. And it really passes along something to the consumer, the end user, that is not nearly as serviceable as even the Mesas that we've seen. You know, they at least ha are a double sided board so that you can service you can service the components for the most part from the top as well as the bottom, but not no not on something like this. So what we're going to be looking for here is some kind of problem either on the output board maybe perhaps or something to do with the phase inverter. I'm assuming this probably is the phase inverter over here. Uh, maybe something coming out of the phase inverter. I'm guessing that these are the coupling caps for this output. Uh, I don't know exactly yet why I would, be, I would have no... Um, seemingly at least no uh, conduction on or con conductivity on one of these output tubes and the other one would be you know getting hot so I don't know why that would be happening and we're gonna have to trace that out but I just wanted to point out first of all just uh, you know the way that this is built and you know you can get a tube amp like this and you can spend very little money but you know just be aware of what you're getting you know you're getting a lot of the same issues that you would be getting on something like the mesas that i've shown where they have a lot of uh just a lot of stuff going on you've got a lot of switching going on you could see these uh light dependent components here uh that are using this probably in the switching circuit i'm guessing these these uh are probably also in the switching circuit these little transistors i guess i guess possibly they could be in here for um, adding distortion as well we want to first of all look for anything that's burned i don't see anything physically that burn that's obviously a problem um i will test out these uh, these fuses it looks like there's a wire there but that's it's kind of hard to tell on a fuse without actually sticking a meter on it but we've got three fuses in this amp on the inside in addition to the fuse that's 
for the mains that's accessible from the outside. So we'll check all the fuses, uh, at least these internal ones, to make sure there's not an issue there. This is not something that was meant for longevity. This was meant, you know, to have something to sell that would be affordable, that would sound pretty good, you know, and they, I guess they more or less accomplished that. I mean, here we are in 2020 and this amp was still going good, um, being from 1995. And, you know, they, I'm sure whoever bought it probably got their money's worth out of it. Let's be fair. Um, but at the same time, you, you've you basically flushed that money if you can't fix something like this. Or if something on the board burns to, to a point where you can't fix it, you're going to be pretty much screwed going forward. So, And I hate the idea that you can't really service this from the top. That all you can really do is clip something out and then J-hook on a new component. Or take the entire this entire board out, which is going to mean... Uh, taking off both of these switches, you have to take all this stuff off. You have to take every single one of these uh, knobs off the front. Um, you have to take the nut off of the jack. You know, all this stuff. All these nuts off these back jacks will have to all come off. And th even then, you're not guaranteed you're going to be able to get this thing out easily because sometimes, man, they make these so tight in here. I don't know, man. Maybe they folded the chassis over at the same, bent it, you know, and then refolded it on to get these things in here. But sometimes, man, they're really hard to get out. Um, and then you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have to also disconnect the transformers to get the board like this out to lift it up. Not a fun thing. Not a fun thing to even think about, let alone do. So I'm gonna try to avoid that at all costs. First thing I think I want to do is I want to check some voltages on these. Uh, on this little output board right here. Okay, so I've got this thing hooked up to a speaker load over here and I'm uh, getting ready to fire it up, but I noticed one thing about this uh, output board here that could uh, could come into play. If we look closely at it, you'll see down here, the way this is connected to the main board is via, via this connector right here. The pins in there sort of push up into another... Um, another socket that's mounted to the bottom of this board you can see that white socket so we've got one on this end and we've also got one over here on this end so this might be something we kind of look at just to make sure that these connectors all these solder joints look okay uh, from on this side at least they it looks like they're all right on this side Uh, some of the ones over here, however, look like they're kind of suspect. That one right there actually looks like it is broken. You can see it? There's actually a couple of them. There's two or three of them right in there that look like the connectors are broken. And I believe, I believe they actually are. See what I'm seeing? One, two, there's four of them right there, all in a row that look like they're broken, the connectors. So maybe that's it. No, there's hell all of them. Look at that. Look at that. Every single one of them. One, two, then these four. So six, six out of the, what, nine or ten connectors there, pins are broken off absolutely so yeah we're not we're gonna do um, first thing we're gonna do is check now we already know what it was doing before because there was no volume for one uh, and this tube on this side the same side as all these broken connectors in fact was ice cold and then this side was hot and we were getting almost no Output. That's exactly the kind of symptom that I would suspect if I saw something. If I just looked at this board and saw this, I would say, man, yeah, this this tube over here probably won't even operate. And then this one will be doing all the work and you will get no sound. So this one will be hot as hell and this one won't have anything. And then, you know, so that's exactly what the, uh, the symptoms that are being displayed. So before I do anything else, I'm going to put a soldering iron to all these connections over here. Uh, for good measure, I'll just go ahead and hit all of the connections on this board, including these over here. Hit those good once. And I think that might take care of the problem, fingers crossed, because I sure as hell don't want to try to pull this board out of here. Okay. Let's go ahead and hit this with the 
soldering iron. Okay. All right, so let's see uh, what that looks like now. We'll compare the before and after. So here's after the repair. And this will actually give me a chance to look at it a little closer too because it's kind of hard to see when you're, not, when you're not seeing it through a screen. I'd say those look about a thousand percent better, wouldn't you? And I'd say they definitely look better. So let's uh, plug it back into the Variac. We'll fire it back up and we'll see if we still have the problem. I'm guessing we're not going to have the problem and it probably will be solved. Okay, we're ready to dial this thing up on the Variac. Uh, so we'll go ahead and go ahead and turn it on. It's, it's on on the front. So let's dial it up. Uh, we'll get it up to about halfway here. Okay, so we have some sound at the output. It's not very much sound though. Okay, so we still have low sound at the output and I'm just We still got a cold tube on this side. Same side, we've got the same cold tube. The other one is hot and this, this one on this side is cold. So it could be that we have more broken connectors underneath the board. You know what I think might be beneficial now at this point is to, uh, is to shut it down uh, and pull this board and uh, basically clean the connectors. I want to check some voltages. Okay, so we got some voltage there, 313 volts on that pin. I'm not sure which pin that is because I'm not sure of the orientation. It'd be nice if it was labeled, but it's not. Uh, that one's negative, so that's probably that's probably the grid. Oh, maybe not. That one's negative also. We've got our high voltage on our, pl our plate and also on our screen on both sides. So it's not a question of the voltage. We've got just a really hot tube on this one side and we've got a really just ice cold tube on the other. I'll tell you what, I'm going to shut it down and I'm going to flop the tubes around. Sometimes the uh, tube tester, it won't catch all possible problems with tubes. So uh, in case that is one of the issues right now, I'm going to um, just eliminate that as a possibility by swapping the tubes. And I'll see if, <clears throat> see if the problem follows the tube uh, or stays with the socket. Okay, so I've gone ahead and swapped these tubes around. So the one that was over on this side is now on this side and vice versa. And uh, I can already tell that the problem is following the tubes and not staying with the socket. One way I can tell, I can measure from the cathode to ground the voltage drop. Uh, and measured on this side, where the uh, suspected bad tube is now, I'm getting no nothing. There's no voltage drop at all. There's no voltage present. And then, But I come over here to this side and go from cathode, and it's actually going through this uh, fuse and I've checked both fuses so the fuses are fine and I've actually got some voltage drop over here on this side yeah so something is definitely present right there but on this side there's nothing present and if I just grab a hold of the tubes underneath the one on this side now is getting hot whereas the one on this side is ice cold so we've got a bad tube and it's just this is one of those cases where 
Uh, my tube tester just simply did not catch the problem. Uh, and now we need to go through also and clean all those pots for sure, clean the jacks and all that good stuff. Uh, but I think we may have this ready to go if we put pop some uh, new output tubes in it. We'll test that out here momentarily. And also something I want to say, it's just worth noting that, you know, some people will criticize me, uh, you know, for pulling the amp out just to replace a couple of tubes. But the thing is, had I not pulled this out, I would not have caught those bad solder joints. And if I popped a new set of tubes in there, yeah, it might have worked for a little bit. And I might have said, yeah, Eureka, I've solved the problem. It was just a pair of output tubes. But then I'd have the problem of uh, that tube going bad again anyway because I did not solve the real source of the issue so this is you know you get criticized a lot when you do this sort of thing especially when you're wide open about it and you're wide open about mistakes and you publish all this crap um, and you're gonna get you know texts come on and say oh you idiot you should have done it this way or I had one one smart ass on the last video I did the Mesa video was like, what did he say? It was something like uh, totally unprofessional, something like that, or, or amateurish, something something to that effect, amateurish or unprofessional. And it's just like, dude, what, you know, what are you even talking about? I don't even know what the, what they're talking about. I think maybe they were talking about, well, you should have changed, just change tubes up front, uh, and that would have solved all the problems. Well, clearly it wouldn't have in the Mesa, and clearly it also wouldn't have done so in this one. So there's two in a row. Where just popping some new tubes in is not going to solve your problem and you're just going to fry a new set of tubes. So, it's your money if you want to do that and be my guest. But sometimes you have to bust out the amp and, you know, more times than not, it's best to just go ahead and take the, you know, remove the chassis at the very outset. Okay, so I was testing some tubes on this uh, crate. Uh, replaced the output tubes, and I was at least getting some sound, but it wasn't very much sound. So I've flipped it over. I'm testing some preamp tubes now. Uh, V1 tested pretty good, so that one's okay, I believe. Uh, V2 tested slightly weak, but it wasn't too bad, so I think it was still function. Uh, V3, however, one side tested slightly weak, and the other side was almost all dead. And I didn't think much of it at the time, but when I popped this thing out, there was some uh, brown goop underneath on the pins. And uh, also down here on the uh, socket, you can still see a little bit of it left, but I kind of sprayed it a, a second ago. But yeah, you can still see a little bit of it left there. Not very much. I've cleaned most of it off, actually. Um, but I pulled V4. Uh, and V4 is just covered up in it as well. I mean, look at this stuff. It's like, I don't know what this is. Maybe somebody, it looks like somebody might have spilled a Coke or something. But that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because this chassis is uh, upside down. It hangs upside down because this is a combo. So why there would be Coke or something spilled underneath it really makes no sense. But you could see, look at the amount of it that's right there on the socket itself so you can imagine how much that would probably be leaking voltage and doing god knows what all um, between the pins on this thing and look at the pins themselves they're just covered up in that goopy stuff what whatever the hell that is i'm not really sure i don't know man it looks like maybe somebody sprayed some socket cleaner or something at one time but it wasn't really socket cleaner I don't know. It looks like maybe they accidentally sprayed the wrong stuff. Oil or something. I don't know, but that's certainly not right. I'm going to clean this tube up and try it on the tester. Um, and I'll certainly clean that up as well. But I don't look for this tube to be good either. Um, what was happening is, uh, you know, after I changed the output tubes, I was getting some sound, but it wasn't very much sound. It sounded like I was losing something somewhere along the line. Like maybe there was a you know dead or weak tube, so I mean that's kind of fits the profile. But whatever caused it looks like it might have something to do with this goop. I'm gonna go ahead and pull a V5 as well, and I was gonna say I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same way, but it doesn't appear to be. So that okay, so that one appears to be clean. That one's 100% clean, but look at the difference between that socket and that socket. Yeah, something was definitely, I don't know, and it's weird too, because you've got some, I've got some kind of scratches 
uh, over here on the chassis as well. I don't know what that's all about. But it looks like maybe somebody at some point did have this thing out and turned upside down and maybe did spill something on it. I don't know. A lot of the... Um, a lot of the knobs as well, the pots are also pretty scratchy and they seem pretty uh, like they're in need of a cleaning. So I'm not sure, um, but we'll definitely clean those. Uh, replace though at least this tube. We'll test these remaining tubes as well though too. Okay, so I went ahead and cleaned this in the sink actually with soap and water and uh, a Scotch Bright pad. And there, you can still actually see a few bits of I don't know. Maybe it's a it's that goop that's still kind of stuck to the pins in places. I got most of it off though, and it looks a lot better than it did. But uh, one half of this tube is dead, nonetheless. I tried it in the tester, and one half is dead, and one half is weak. And it's no surprise with a socket that looks like that that you would have some issues with a tube that's stuck in there for any length of time. So yeah, both of these tubes have one weak side and one dead side on the triodes. So. Um, we got one more tube to test, but we've got two tubes to replace so far, but let's test this one out. Okay, so skipping ahead a little bit, I've been working on this crate a little bit more, and uh, long story short, I tested it out with um, a couple new tubes in there, some new output tubes, and replaced uh, a couple of tubes in the preamp, and uh, it's, it made it a little bit better, but still was getting a lot of distortion. Um, something still not quite right in here and just given the fact that I already had some bad solder joints on the top that I could see uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the board now this this is interesting the way that they've built this because the back panel if you'll notice it has some screw holes here uh, that hold this back panel onto this piece of the chassis so you can actually remove the back so you, and I think you even have to do that in order to get the chassis out so we'll start with removing that okay so we have the back panel off of this uh, crate and we're gonna do some work on this I'm gonna pull the board up but to do that we're gonna have to uh, remove all of these connections here with these terminals on the board uh, and I need a record of it so I'm gonna film this kind of as a record as my own personal thing to get this back and I'm just gonna try to do this logically and start this way and move my way across here's the output board uh, we can see the screen resistors there and even though they're upside down in this amplifier and you know are subject to some measure of heat they do leave a, a gap there between them and the board so they have not burned the board or even discolored it um, so that's good uh, we do have a couple of diodes yeah a couple more on this end but yeah, so there's the output board. All right, so let's pull this board now. Um, this is, man, construction like this is just really a, really a real big pain. It would have been nice if they had separated a couple of these, you know, separated this out into a couple boards and maybe made it easier to pull. Um, but the way they've got this in here is, you know, it is what it is. It's PCB construction. This is one of the downfalls of PCB construction. You're looking at it right here. Just this little this little dance of trying to get a board out so you can see the underside of it. Six hours later. All right. So there's the chassis without the board. Here's the board. Um, and what we want to do now is just look at each and every one of these. Oh, I've got a visitor. Let's see who that is. Who could it be? Oh, look who it is. Hi, Ivy Sue. Um, hi, um, can I bring the bicycle at your house? Sure, okay. <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay, so I've got the board out now on this blue Voodoo, and uh, I, I did notice that the couple of sockets that I said that were dirty, that looked like they had been sprayed with something that was, I don't know, like greasy, those have grease underneath and on and on the this side of the board as well so this is all full of greasy crap so we'll have to spray all that out and, and it, you'll notice it looks like somebody had used that same spray probably at some point on these pots because look at this it's all greasy and just nasty up here also and it looks like maybe they just kind of sprayed it in the general direction of the pots 
either that or it's something that's been spilled in here because it's like you see how just see how nasty it is it's kind of all over everything i don't know if that has anything to do with what's going on but you see how actually i mean that's that's greasy still don't really see any obvious issues other than a few on the other side we'll go ahead and flip it over we possibly have some bad solder joints, but uh, nothing that really stands out, nothing that looks burned. Um, for instance, I can show you, see right there, that's that's one of the mounts for the sockets, and that one is definitely bad. That's a bad joint that needs to be re-soldered. That one is questionable right beside it. Uh, that one is a mount, I think, also, or I don't know, it looks questionable. No, that's the mount right there. And that one definitely needs to be resoldered. That one is questionable. And there's another mount over here that looks okay, but you know those mounts need to be resoldered. There are some mounts over here on this other one. That one right there is obviously bad. The one right next to it, I don't know. It looks okay, but questionable possibly. That mount looks bad right there. That one. Uh, that one's questionable. So, I mean, we've got definitely some mounts that we need to take care of. But you can kind of see what I'm talking about right there. You see the circle around that that uh, solder joint right there? That's that's kind of a that's a broken solder joint is what that is. And there's three of them. There's one there, one up here, and one up there in a triangular shape. And that one's definitely broken. This one up here is looks like it's broken too. And then this one over here is questionable as well. I'm going to re-solder all of the questionable um, solder joints under here including all of these mounts that are broken i'm going to spray all these sockets out really well and clean them all but as far as everything else on here i really don't see anything that's just obvious that looks like you know it's, it's an obvious issue that doesn't mean there isn't something so i'm just going to go through and anything that even looks remotely suspicious i'm going to hit it with the soldering iron and um, so we'll at least have that taken care of and I'll clean everything while I'm under here really well and have the board out. It'll just make it a lot easier to do that. For now, we're still searching for the problem. So probably what'll be next after that is after I clean these sockets and you can still see it too. You can still see the, the junk on this side as well. And I could feel it too. It's just really greasy on these, on these two sockets, particularly these two middle ones. And you can see it too. It's kind of reflected. I don't know, it's got like an orange peel kind of thing going on right around it. See how reflective it is and just kind of orange peely? And then it sort of stops out here. If you get far enough away from those sockets, there's a big pull of it right here. See what I mean? There's just, I don't know. I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not, but we're going to clean it up just in case it does. Okay, dudes, uh, got this back up on the bench, got everything plugged back up. It took a little while. I had to refer to the videos that I made several times, really, to and pause it to figure out where everything went. If you ever have to take a board out like this, that's a really good tip. Uh, film yourself doing it, or, you know, short of that, at least take photographs or draw a diagram. Photogra photographs and video are really best. Um, I'm not going to zip tie anything together just yet or any of that stuff because I want to make sure everything works. Started the signal tracing process, which is the next thing that we were going to do. And I want to show you something interesting that was going on with this in the signal tracing. This is the first gain stage right here. Okay, so this is this is the first half of V1. So that number two right there, that is your uh, grid. Uh, number one is the uh is the plate going out of that stage so if you measure at the grid you should get the same signal that you see at the input uh, and then coming out of number one you should get the amplified signal and then and then so on you can trace it on down the chain you know all the way out to the output but this one was doing something weird when i did my little preliminary uh, signal trace check this out so what i'm going to do i'm going to fire this up and then i'm going to very quickly grab my probe uh, i have uh, my signal generator plugged in, uh, it is running into the input. So right now, if I turn my amp on, actually, I should be able to, yeah. Okay, so that's the hot lead. Uh, then you come into 
pin two right there, and again, it should be about the same there as it is here. And it more or less is. It's maybe a little bit diminished because there is a uh, resistor on the input. So there's the input. There's grid one on the first gain stage. So check this out. I'm gonna I'm gonna flip this on. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. It is on, and the amp is firing up. I'm gonna stick my probe right here on pin two. Now watch this. As the amp warms up, it just disappears. Completely disappears. I mean, well, not completely, but but right there, you see. So I've got my signal there, but listen to the grid, the grid right there. There's nothing. So I've got some kind of problem, most likely with the tube. So as the tube is heating up, which it's so weird, it's so funny too, because I'll, I will, I'll fix, you know, a hundred amps and I won't see a problem like that necessarily. But then I'll get two back to back that are almost you know almost identical in the way that they behave. I, the the Mesa boogie that I did last on this channel, uh, I'll put a link up somewhere up here if you want to go check that out. But um, yeah, it was doing something similarly kind of funky with the the tubes. The tubes were f sort of I don't know they were displaying some weird symptoms when they, as they failed. So. But yeah, so that is uh, the result of that. So what I want to do now is actually, I want to swap tubes. So I want to take this one out. And I tested these tubes as well, and I found out that I had two bad ones, and they just happened to be in the sockets that were covered up in that goop. Um, this one, I don't think, I mean, it tested good. The rest of them tested good. So everything in here now should be good tubes. Um but this is telling me, this test at least, that that tube might not be good. So I'm going to take that tube out of the amp. I'm going to replace it with one of these other tubes that are in the, another socket. And I want to test it again and see if it does the same thing. If it does do the same thing, then I'm going to start looking at the board uh, and some of the surrounding components. Okay, so I took the tube out of V2 and I stuck it in V1. And we're going to try that again. Let's do the same test again with the probe. Boom. And then let's test the grid. There it goes. It dies away again. So what would be happening to this that would make that die away like that? I don't know, honestly. It must, it could possibly be one of the LDRs kicking in. Well, let me test actually, because um, I'm not sure how the switching is working on this. I'm going to switch these three switches on the front uh, to, their, to a different uh, setting. And no, it's... The problem is still there, so so yeah, something else is going on. Let's uh, let's check out what other components are connected to that tube socket and that stage of gain, and see what else could possibly be going wrong. Okay, so I was sitting here looking at the schematic off camera, and I was just wondering to myself what the hell could be even possibly going wrong because we have the input right there, and then we have. Uh, we have a you know a ground reference resistor, a grid leak resistor right there, and then we have a uh, grid stopping resistor, a 47k right there into the grid, which is pin two, right, right there. But then we have this line running off over to here, which is going to ground, which is I don't know why they would do that, but it's basically shunting the grid to ground uh, when there's no jack plugged in. So I guess it's I don't know. Not really sure why they would do that. So this is a ground lug, and it got me thinking, oh, well, yeah, duh, uh, Eureka. Okay, so I popped those couple screws in where there's ground lugs, one right there, and there's another one way over here on this side. So I popped those screws in, and we'll try it again and see if that fixed the problem. Nope, there it goes. It goes away again. Okay, so I've skipped ahead just a little bit. Uh, I wanted to spare you some of the some of the hair pulling here, but essentially I'll I'll round it up for you. What happened is I wasn't getting any voltages in any of the places I should have gotten voltages, like on the the plates of any of the tubes, including the output tubes. On the plates of the output tubes, I was only getting like a a hundred volts 
or something, you know, something tiny like that. Come to find out, I th I'm pretty sure the reason is some of these uh, are being grounded, I think, through these lugs. If you don't have the other side of this board uh, connected on the underside, there's, you're not getting any grounds, I don't think, with through this board. Yeah, so I, I got my voltage back, but the voltages, the voltages at my plate, 508 volts on the plate which that's very high i think it's supposed to be like the schematic calls for like 460 volts and again this overall consumption is supposed to be closer to 85 watts instead of 104 watts at idle i am getting sound switches all work so all of that seems to be all of that seems to be okay, um, but you know again we're way higher than we should be right now, and we're supposed to be like like I said, 85 watts in total consumption. So really, we should look something like like that ish. Okay, that's what it should look like at idle if it's healthy. The problem is I think there are two different versions of this amplifier and this is an early version that has a hum balance pot instead of a bias adjust pot. There's no bias adjust pot in here. This is uh, this is AP1, that's adjustable pot number one right there. And that's the only adjustable pot that's like that, that's labeled like that in this amp. Um, and that's supposed to be on the schematic that I see, that's supposed to be a bias adjust pot. But here, if we look at the plate voltage where it's supposed to be there, you, you see 450 volts. I mean, that's way back down to earth. That's where it should be. So I'm going to have to adjust the bias on this in a kind of a non-traditional way. I may, um, I may even consider coming in here and putting an adjustable bias possibly or i may just find a fixed resistor that will work with this set of tubes either way it's going to be better than what it was and i'll have to track down which of these components and i think it's right over here because that's the bias uh diode right there uh and i think those are also in the bias circuit those um those capacitors so i think one of these resistors right here is probably what has to change okay so an interesting thing about this amplifier that I did not realize until just now is that the schematic that I've been using is not even the correct schematic. Late 94, early 95 is when this particular amp was built. This amp has four 12AX7, five 12AX7 tubes, whereas the schematic only has four. I mean, what did they get rid of? Because it, it wasn't the reverb, apparently, because the schematic does show reverb. I can't say for certain what the differences are. Now the layout is very similar, but there's only four preamp tubes in the, schema in the schematic that I've been looking at. Pretty weird, but I, it turns out I did not need it because what I ended up doing to find out what was wrong with this, now I uh, had done some signal tracing and I'll kind of show you briefly here what were the results of the signal tracing. Okay, so I'm actually using a signal generator here that's a just a small, very simple signal generator. You can buy these online. Uh, some different sources. I will link this particular signal generator down in the description. If you want to get one of these, you have to kind of build it yourself. Some of them you can build yourself. Some of them you can order already built, but it's a pretty simple one to build. It doesn't take very long. I think it took me about, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or something, maybe 30 minutes to build the thing. But that's what I'm using because that's what I've got over here at this particular house. Now, you don't have to have a lot of really sophisticated equipment to do a simple signal trace and and when i say signal trace i just simply mean following the path of the signal throughout the amplifier to see where you might be uh having problems so here's what i've done to set up a signal trace okay i've got my probe uh, which is leading to a an amplifier that's here on my desk you can't see it it's off camera back over there uh, but you'll be able to hear it though so if i uh, we'll go ahead and fire up the amp. Now, the negative, the negative of the probe <clears throat> is going to the chassis. So this white wire is just going over here to the ground point on the chassis. Uh, then the tip is going to the tip of this probe. So we'll be able to probe 
uh, different places. And inside this, you can't just use any old probe. Inside this, you have to have uh, some kind of um, uh, some kind of capacitor uh, to couple the two, so it blocks the DC. So if you hit a point where it's got uh, high voltage DC, you won't blow up your amp. I'll go a little bit more in depth on a maybe a dedicated video, but for now, just suffice to say, that's what we're doing is a very simple, rudimentary signal trace. I'm gonna fire up the amplifier now, and right now I'm just again I'm just running running into the uh, input here with the with the signal generator. Now I can already tell something's weird and off because it first of all it's not very loud. Okay, second of all, when I do turn it up, I start to get some weird distortion if I go past a certain point. Like it just, it really starts to distort rather badly the higher I turn it up. Now, if I were to put a guitar signal through this, it gets even worse. Uh, the, the quality of the sound is just very distorted. Uh, and very bad. It's, it just sounds very sick overall. Um, but here is how I do the signal trace. So I can turn the volume down and we'll just test out. Okay, so so that is coming right off of the input jack. So that's on the jack itself. So that's what's coming in. Then here is at the uh, pin 2. Okay, so significantly lower. So we're going through a uh, grid stopping resistor. I wouldn't expect it to be that much lower right there. Uh, but it is. Now sometimes you'll get that. But on the if you go to pin 1, which is the uh, plate of this tube. Now that's high voltage. There's going to be high voltage right there on the plate. But you again, you're blocking that high voltage DC with a uh, capacitor that's on, in your probe. So we're going from this in, into the tube to this coming out. So much, much louder coming out. So that stage is amplifying. So that half of the 12X7 is working. Now I don't know because of the schematic difference. I can't trust the schematic that I have. Uh, on the computer, I'm just having to do this pretty much just to see what is going on here. So I can go to over to pin 7. There's nothing there coming into pin 7 on the second half of that. Nothing on pin 6 either. There's nothing there. So that half of the tube is probably doing something else in the circuit. So let's skip down to the next one. Now, that we'll put that under our hats though and we'll... Uh, think about whether or not something might be going on there that is not right. Okay, so we do have a we do have a resistor here that is a plate resistor, and a, and apparently it is supplying some voltage because I hear some popping. So something's going on there. Somebody's home, but I'm not sure exactly what that's being used for. Uh, so let's skip on down. We'll go to V2. We'll see what's coming into V2. I hear nothing there either. Nothing there either. Nothing there. Do I even have all these on? Yeah, they're all on. Oh, that I see. I know why. Because I didn't have the volume up at all. Okay, so let me turn the volume up. Hang on. Okay, so you're going to be hearing uh, some some volume right now that's just coming out the output because I'm not using a um, I'm not using a dummy load on this, so I'm using an actual speaker now. If I wanted to do this really a better way, I would grab my dummy load over there and hook that up, but I'm too lazy at the moment. I'm just going to turn it up slightly, just for illustrative purposes. Kind of ignore that sound and just listen to uh, the change in sound as I touch various points. So I'm going to look at. The second half of V1, I can hear. I can hear I've got sound coming into it. 
and I can hear it's amplifying as well. So somebody's home right there. Now let's move on down. Here's coming into V2. I do have signal coming in. I've got amplified signal going out. Now let's skip over here to the second half of it. I've got signal coming in. Way amplified signal coming out. So we're somebody's home there. I've got nothing coming in here. So this is so this is doing something else. This might be um, part of the reverb. Not really sure on that. But we'll keep that under our hats that somebody's not home right there, possibly. So we've got a lot of signal being amplified right there. We've got signal going in and coming out. So somebody's home there on the second half. We've got signal coming in there. Nothing coming out, but I suspect... And that's exactly why, because that is a uh, that's a cathode follower right there, and that could be the case over here as well. Or what was it here? No, it was it's there. Something, something that's being used for something else. This is a uh, this is a cathode follower on this half. See there? Okay. Now, so somebody is definitely home there. Uh, now on the next one down, we've got, there's pin 7, we got something coming in, we got something way being amplified coming out. Now if we go over here to uh, V5 right here, now I'll show you what I've discovered. We've got signal going in, right there. That's the grid going into that tube, the, uh, the, the first half. Now here's what's coming out. Nothing. There's nothing coming out. So why is that? Why would I have something going in and nothing coming out? I, I can go over here also to the to the cathode and nothing's coming out of there either. And because of its position in the circuit, <clears throat> turn that down. Just because of its position in the circuit, I know that that really highly likely is the phase inverter because that's the last tube in the chain. Um, so that's probably the phase inverter. And one half is not working. Now the, uh, we can check the other half as well. Just to make sure. We got something coming in. We got something going out. So that is one half is working. The other half is not working. We need to understand why it's not working. Let's look at the plate voltage on that point right there on this tube. Our plate voltage is almost zero. Here is the plate resistor for this half and on this side again we've got nothing on that side of the plate resistor that's the side facing the tube and then the other side we've got 400 volts on the other side of that plate resistor so R86 plate resistor is open okay so looking a little closer at the schematic I can see clearly now why uh, there's only four tubes the reverb on the schematic that I have in front of me is driven by ICs. This earlier example that I have on the bench uh, has tube reverb. Okay, so but the issue that I found uh, was right here with this little resistor. This is the plate resistor that feeds uh, one half of this phase inverter, and that's the 82.5K. I don't have that value on hand, unfortunately, so I, I'm going to have to... Well, I might have it, actually. I'll have to dig around and see if I've got it, but I don't know if I've got that value on hand. I may have to order some of those. But I think why I'm getting positive voltage right here is because uh, this capacitor could be leaking some DC across, and when it leaks DC across to here, it's also going to leak it through over to here and over to this point, too. Uh, so I, that's why I was seeing it in both places. Uh, so I think we might have a bad capacitor right there that might have overdriven this, which uh, pulled too much current uh, through this plate resistor and burned that plate resistor. I'll probably also have to check the other resistors surrounding this as well as the uh, presence control. If I see any more issues, I'll check all these other resistors too. I think probably if I replace uh, just that resistor and that capacitor, that's probably going to solve all the problems of this amplifier, though. Okay, so I went ahead and pulled the board again and replaced the plate resistance 
uh, for that side of the phase inverter and uh, I replaced it with two resistors instead of waiting on one resistor because I did not have 82 it this called for 82 and a half uh, K which I did not have in stock I usually don't stock um, but I went ahead and ordered some 82s and was waiting for them to come in but it was just taking too long and there was a turned out to be a mistake with the order so instead of waiting on those I'm just going to go ahead and replace those with two resistances that will equal 80 instead of the 82 which I mean over time that will probably go up slightly anyway to equal just a little bit higher than 80 so it's not that big of a deal it doesn't have to be too precise uh, and we're in the ballpark there with with 80k so I'm okay with that I did go ahead and trace back and replace the uh, capacitor before that stage as well because I was noticing some uh, positive DC on the grid there so I was in an effort to try to eliminate that or just make sure it was okay I replaced that capacitor um, I don't think it was at fault anyway I don't think there was a fault with it it turned out uh, but I did just go ahead and replace it regardless so while I had the board out rather than trying to pull the board again and then test it and then figure out I had I should have went ahead and done that I just went ahead and replaced it why the hell not um, but anyway, I'm confident this probably has solved the issue, so let's fire it up here for the first time and see. Oh, there we go. Now there's life. I've cleaned these uh, pots about two or three times now and they're still scratchy, so I don't know. I don't know what's going on with that. at least gotten us back to full power so that definitely was the problem all right guys uh, back with this blue voodoo or blue doo-doo as some people call these things uh, I don't think the thing sounds too awful bad uh, personally I mean you can dial in good tones it's just I think they have kind of tried to do too much sort of with this thing this is an early version of the blue voodoo the B the BV60 combo this one again is from probably early 1995 as this sticker would seem to indicate the schematic that I had been looking at for a while that only had four tubes instead of uh, five preamp tubes was from a revision from 1998 you know there's a couple different versions of the blue voodoo just keep that in mind now there's a pod on the back here that in this version of the amp is used for hum balance uh, on the later version of the amp, it seems to have a bias adjust, okay, so that you can uh, adjust the bias. It has a, a really a more traditional uh, biasing circuit in it. This early version, however, uh, is really interesting for one major reason, and that is the bias circuit that is in this is a is an automatic biasing circuit. So. And this, it took me a kind of a while to figure this out. I was like, what is going on with the bias on this thing? Because I had fired it up, dialed it up on the Variac, and as I was dialing it up, I noticed, man, the plate voltage on this is going through the roof. It's going to like 510 volts on the plates of the output tubes. And I was thinking, man, this thing, it's going to fry these output tubes. So yeah, this is that automatic bias circuit that I was talking about. As you can see up here, the interesting feature of this is that, okay, so this is the output. Uh, and here you have the bias that's coming into the grids, as you normally would a fixed uh, grid bias circuit. Uh, but that's where pretty much the similarities to a grid, normal grid bias circuit end. It's not the best drawing, but 
I more or less just traced it out and this is what I came up with. This uses an MPS A56 which is a Motorola transistor, a PNP transistor, uh, to help regulate these uh, voltages between the uh, grid of the tube and also what's going on to the cathodes. So right over here on this part of the circuit it ends up going to the cathode of one tube and then the cathode of the other tube uh, through these fuses. <clears throat> so you can see the fuse, one fuse here, one fuse here. So if this circuit uh, overloads, one of these fuses will pop. You can see uh, the violet, this J33, this violet is feeding your bias into this point. And then you've got bias circuit pretty much ranging all the way over. These are in the bias circuit, this stuff over here. You've got stuff ranging in here. All this is bias circuit. Uh, and these are bias. This is a part of the bias circuit uh, all up in here. So you've got stuff pretty much ranging all over the place. And that's where all this stuff is. You've got a lot of these Zener diodes in here. Uh, going pretty much every which direction. You know, I'm I'm not going to analyze this circuit. If you want to sit down and analyze this, you can. Frankly, I don't I don't 100% even understand it myself, but it does somehow uh, kind of bridge the gap between a cathode bias circuit and a grid bias circuit <clears throat> because this circuit is uh, it affects both. But at any rate, it's uh, it's here. It's done. It's ready to go. So that's the repair of this. We'll uh, give it a test. Bye. <laughs> 